that get you? Yes, go ahead and introduce it all again. All right. Well, again, uh, welcome to the, the Lower Middle Tennessee Extension Agent Lunch Series. Uh, we, our group of agents, have been sponsoring this lunch series uh, since soon after we um, we were sent home with COVID back in back in early April. I think Matt was mentioning this is about the 50th one that we've done. And uh, today we've got the opportunity to listen and hear from Dr. Karen Vale, who's an uh, urban integrated pest management specialist. And I know just recently, about a year ago, she came down to here in our county to do a program for our, some of our nursing home folks that had been having some issues with bed bugs and did a wonderful job. And we thought our group that this would be a wonderful topic to to include in our lunch series so dr vale we certainly appreciate you being with us and uh i will try to kind of watch the chat box if there's any questions and with that i'll i'll thank you and turn it over to you okay well i'm gonna jump right in maybe Here we go. So yeah, today we're, we're gonna discuss bed bugs, uh, their biology and, and how to control them. It's gonna uh, be interesting to see how COVID affects the bed bug populations in some of our large uh, housing communities because you know hosts are probably home more frequently than they were in the past and um, pest management professionals may not be allowed in to do building lot inspections. So it'll be interesting to see how this turns out. So first we're gonna, we'll talk about biology, why it's a pest, and of course, probably the thing you're most interested in is in the management of this pest. So if you look back through history, we'll see some of the earliest writings back in Greece in 400 BC, talking about the bed bugs. And we can see it making its way uh, across the world into England by the late 1500s, we have writings. And basically as we bring settlers from England and elsewhere to the US, all their cargo, all their belongings, uh, they're also bringing bed bugs with them. So for hundreds of years, bed bugs were a steady companion uh, with us uh, until about the 1940s or so, we see the um, uh, discovery of synthetic insecticides. We have DDT being applied in the 50s and 60s. We have malathion and DDT. And pretty much by the 60s or so, Bed bugs populations have really, really decreased. Still present in some populations, but overall uh, not very commonly found. And it's not until the late 1900s, or early 2000s, that they start making a comeback. So here's the uh, common bed bug, Cymex lectularius. This is not a life size photo. Uh, they only get up to about a, a quarter of an inch long. Uh, but you could see as they feed, they elongate, and not only are they getting longer, but they're getting deeper. So they're actually ballooning up, just like you would fill up a water balloon. Um, they're gonna feed for two to 10 minutes or so, and then go back to their harborage. So nothing like a tick where it may be attached to you for days. It's just feeding for a few minutes and back it goes. Right before it finishes feeding or just after it finishes feeding, it will defecate. And so you'll get this fecal specking. And it can be kind of a tarry looking three-dimensional speck like this, especially when it's on a hard surface. When it's on a, a woven surface, like you see here on the box spring, it almost looks like someone's taken a black ink pen and touched it to the fabric. Uh, some people also uh, say that it also looks like um, mildew on a mattress. So um, bed bugs are very similar to cockroaches in that they aggregate. The, the younger uh, nymphal stages will cluster with the uh, adult bed bugs. You can see these cute little first instars here with the clear bodies. They haven't fed yet. This newly hatched, they have little red eyes. I personally think they make the perfect pet, right? No litter box to change, no walks to take, no food to buy, 
you go about your day, they go about their day, they're happy. Probably you aren't so much, but they are. So bed bugs are very well adapted to their hosts. Now they like to feed on people, but they'll feed on uh, other mammals, they'll feed on bats, they'll feed on birds. Uh, basically anything that's sitting still for a while uh, can be a host of theirs. And you see they're most active at night when we're sleeping, when we don't appreciate them coming on us. Finding us using carbon dioxide as the long distance lure, bringing them in, and then heat and chemicals, letting you know the host is nearby. And then they, you know, they'll inject a, a numbing agent. And as the mandibles and maxillae work their way through the skin to find that capillary tube, they're injecting anticoagulants. And then that Siberian pump is pulling in that blood out of the body. They move pretty quickly. So we, we docked one here going 7.6 feet in a minute. So if you're thinking, I've been driving for hours, I finally got to this hotel, I'm going to take a break, uh, decide to lie down on the bed. Well, within a minute, that bed bug can get from the mattress where it might be hiding to, to feed on you. Just 7.6 feet in a minute. They have an unusual uh, mating um, behavior in that the male actually punctures the female's abdomen. So on the left, let's see here. So this is a male and he's whipping his abdomen underneath the female and he's gonna insert his paramere right here. He's gonna push it through the abdominal wall. Uh, and then the sperm makes its way through the body cavity to the ovarials. So because we think this is one of the two reasons that the females Will disperse from a cluster. If there's too many males present, they're going to move away from that cluster because the more they mate, their survival decreases. The other reason we think they move away is because it's overcrowded and there's not enough space for them to harbor. So if you look through the old literature, we see that they laid five eggs a day, 200 to 500 eggs in a lifetime. But if we look at more modern bed bugs, we're seeing a half to two eggs in a day and maybe 113 eggs in a lifetime. And we think there's a trade-off that's been made. Um, now we know that most of our bed bug populations are resistant to uh, pyrethroids. There was one study that looked at 118 populations throughout the US and um, found that about 88, 89% of them had one or two known mutations that gave it uh, resistance to pyrethroids. So most of our populations are resistant to pyrethroids. Uh, we know that eggs can hatch by about nine or 10 days, seven to 10 days. And so often the PMP, the pest management professional is treating at two week intervals to get the nymphs after they've hatched out of the egg. It's much more difficult to, to uh, kill the egg than it is the other stages. So um, this is to go through the life cycle with you. If you go to the top left corner, you'll see um, the egg, which and all these lines over here are millimeter lines. So the egg's about a millimeter long. Typically it's wider than this. This one's hatched. You're just looking at the chorion, just the exoskeleton there. Um, it hatches. It's also one millimeter long, light beige, light colored. It hasn't fed yet. Here you see it after it has fed. So almost doubling in size. I mean, they just act like a water balloon and fill up. And so they have to get a full meal and then they'll molt to the next stage. Then they'll need to find another meal and molt again. And they'll do this five times until they become an adult. And once they become an adult, they're not gonna molt anymore, but they're still gonna feed. And in general, the unfed adults have are an oval shape, although the male it's a slightly more pointy uh, abdomen compared to the female. But look how they change their shape when they're fully engorged. They went from being oval shaped to being more torpedo shaped. So you need to also be able to recognize these fed bed bugs as being bed bugs too. It's probably easier to recognize a male from a female when they're fully engorged like this because this last abdominal segment tends to be asymmetrical off to the side where the female tends to be centered. Now I know you're getting worried. These bugs are gonna suck all the blood out of me while I'm sleeping. So we did some math. 
And it turns out you need over 28,000 adult female bed bugs feeding on you at once to get a cup of your blood. So we'll double that, 57,000 to drink a pint of your blood, right? And that's what you're uh, donating when you go uh, to do that. If we look at the total amount of blood in a person, we'll average 10 pints per person. Then you would have to have 576,000 adult female bed bugs feeding on you on this, at the same time to exsanguinate you or suck all the blood out of you. So you know that that's not gonna happen. Although we have had cases where people have de developed anemia when they've lived with bed bug infestations for a very long time. So how long do bed bugs live? Well, if they have a host nearby and it's at least 70 degrees, they tend to live three to 10 months. They take about five to eight days between each uh, molt. And so about 37 days, so six, seven weeks to go from egg to adult. Uh, but they have to have that full, full blood meal. If they're interrupted, they're gonna have to come back and feed again. If they don't have access to a host, we're averaging about 70 days for them to live, but it varies on the stage. You see the little first instar lasts about three weeks and your fifth instar is about 70 days. Of course, there's always those outliers that can live much longer. You'll see in the literature occasionally mention, you know, bed bugs that lived over a year without feeding. So don't think about, don't think that you can starve them out. All right, can you tell the bug from the bite? No, but could you get suspicious? Yes. So if you see bed bug bite or bites in a line or in a cluster, then you should be suspicious that it could be caused by bed bugs and maybe put out some monitors or do an inspection of the property to see if bed bugs are present. So what happens is it, this could be a bunch of bed bugs feeding at once. Then typically they're gonna feed on exposed parts of the body. They don't feed through clothing. Uh, it could be they're interrupted. You move, you're sleeping, you roll over a little bit. They pull out. It could be they inserted the proboscis into the skin and missed the capillary. So they're gonna pull out and search again. Uh, you, you might have interrupted them, or it could be just a ton of them feeding at once. Now, bed bugs do not discriminate. They don't look at the color of your skin. They just want to, they'll be attracted to you if you're giving off carbon dioxide, and as they get closer, they want that heat and chemical cues to indicate a host is present. But not everybody reacts the same. So there's been several studies that show the elderly do not react to a bed bug bite as frequently as younger cohorts. So this one study had 474 participants, 42% of those over the age of 65 did not react. Uh, the younger cohort, 11 to, 65%, 7, 11 to 65 years, 26% did not react to that bed bug bite. And in another study in Kentucky, 76% of the elderly uh, did not react to a bed bug bite. So if you're thinking about these high rises for the elderly, you can see where the populations get out of control. They don't see very well, and they're not reacting to the bite. They don't know they have bed bugs. Fortunately, to date, we have not documented bed bugs transmitting disease-causing organisms to humans. We've had dozens and dozens of disease-causing organisms found in the bed bug, but we're not seeing able to transmit it. So that, that's good news there. Probably the biggest issue we have is mental health issues, uh, stress. Like just the thought of something feeding on you when you're sleeping, when you're most vulnerable, is very disturbing. So there's a stress related with that, wondering if they're feeding on you. Um, there's a lot of stress in preparing for the treatments. Um, there's ostracism, worried about you know not letting your kids go visit, not letting anyone come over. There's economic costs, which add to the stress. So uh, just not a very pleasant experience dealing with bed bugs. So, you know, Tennessee has not missed out on their resurgence. If you look in this list of Orkin's top 50 bed bug treatment cities, you'll see that we have two um, Tennessee cities that made the top 30 and Knoxville is in the top 25. So at least we can tell our our UT administrators that Tennessee made the top, top 25 and something. So where do we find bed bugs? Well, just about anywhere we're gonna spend time where we're immobile. So of course, where we're sleeping, our single family homes, 
in college dorms, hotels, motels, nursing homes, but we're also finding them in our place of business and office buildings, in schools and hospitals, on modes of transportation, and even movie theaters. So you think in movie theaters, it's dark, people are immobile, they're there for a few hours, bed bug only needs a few minutes to come feed. So I tell folks when you're going to the theater, when and if we get to go back, we um, just bring what you need. Just bring your person, you know, don't bring a purse you're going to put on the ground. Don't bring a jacket you're going to bring under the chair. Put your wallet in your pants and your keys in your pocket and that's all you need to bring with you. Bed bugs just are just great hitchhikers. They have these tarsal claws and it's very easy for them to grab onto rough clothing. So where else are we finding this? Well, you saw the news in the past years, retail stores have found bed bugs present. Airplanes, you know, your luggage is put together, those infested luggage along with yours. Bed bugs can climb from one to the other. Even libraries here in Knox County, I think they do quarterly um, canine scent detection team inspections. And if the dog indicates that bed bugs are in a stack, they take those uh, books down and put them through a, a heat chamber. Of course, laundromats and even restaurants, we can spread bed bugs. Bed bugs are our most difficult pest to control, far exceeding any other pest that the pest management community deals with. So where did this rebound occur? Why did we see this resurgence in the late 1990s, early 2000s? Well, we were traveling to places where bed bugs were still common. We no longer spray um, as broad an area indoors as we used to. You know, in the 40s and 50s, you might have sprayed down a whole wall to get cockroaches or mosquitoes. You know, for cockroaches, now we use baits. So there's no reason for a bed bug to come in contact with that insecticide. Or we might put a spray into a crack in a crevice, but we're not putting it everywhere. We know that there's an issue. We've documented resistance now. We weren't aware of bed bugs. You know, when I, I never saw a real bed bug before the late 90s. Um, I, I've seen pictures of them in textbooks, but I had never experienced it. So there's a training that needed to take place for the PMPs. Matter of fact, I think I misidentified my first one. I had one sent in from a hotel in the East Tennessee area, and I couldn't decide looking at the images whether it was a bed bug or a bat bug. And I think I went with bat bug, and I didn't keep that specimen. That was our first bed bug. Uh, the effect of insecticides, many of our carbamates and organophosphates are no longer used indoors. And then in South America, where they still have access to these problems, to these products, they don't have the same problems that we have. We have lots more clutter. Have you ever looked at a picture of your grandparents or great grandparents' home and then look at your home? We have a lot more stuff in our houses, lots of places for bed bugs to hide. You see folks turning over apartments very frequently. Uh, and there's often people fail to report bed bugs, so they spread throughout multi-unit structures fairly easily. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of funding to, for bed bug research because they aren't considered a disease vector, and so the health officials aren't dedicating money to them. And we aren't seeing a lot of preventive inspections being done, although it is getting better. Um, and the end, well, the beginning of the last century, if you were to move into an apartment, they may have fumigated your stuff before you move, moved in. We don't, don't do that anymore. So all these re reasons, all these things came together to form this perfect storm for the bed bug resurgence. So how do we manage them? Well, identification is very important. And uh, we are actually in the process, we're actually in the planning stages of making resin displays to send to each county. So we want to have the egg, all the five inch stars, the male and the female, we're gonna see if we can fit that fecal specking sample in there. So you'll have an example to refer back to. But we, uh, right now we have hired the student, but we haven't done any training. So it'll be months before we have those produced. After we identify properly, we have to educate everyone on what their role is, how to prevent spreading the bed bugs or bringing more home. Uh, then we have to thoroughly inspect, apply non-chemical and possibly chemical controls, and then follow up to make sure we've actually gotten rid of the bed bugs. In general, I think on average, two to three treatments in an uncluttered home to get rid of bed bugs. All right, one, two, three, or four, which one do you think is the bed bug? Oh, 
forward. Four. Is that the consensus? Yeah. So carpet beetle larvae are often sent in as bed bugs. And I think because people might be finding these on their beds, that they think they're bed bugs, but they really don't look anything like a bed bug. In the top right, we have a cat flea. This one's flattened from the sides, bed bugs flattened top to bottom. Bottom left is a tick. Of course, ticks have different type of mouth parts. The bed bugs have a straw-like mouth parts. Ticks, adult ticks will have eight legs. Bed bugs will have six. If you look closely at this bed bug, so up to a quarter inch long, it's gonna have four segmented antennae, one, two, three, and four. And this fourth segment will be shorter than the third. And that proboscis, that straw-like mouth parts, will only reach to about the first pair of legs. So that it has in common with the bat bug. Bat bug is on the left, bed bug is on the right. Bat bugs will be feeding on bats, but when the bats leave the roost, if the nursery is vacated, then the bat bugs won't have a host and they'll come down to look for humans to feed on. And so most of the control efforts will have to be concentrated in that roost. So it's important to distinguish between bed bugs and bat bugs. It's very easy to do this. If you look at the hairs right here on the pronotum, on the bat bug, the hairs are very long and they're longer than the width of this eye. If you look at the bed bug, the hairs are shorter than the width of the eye. To me, these hairs kind of stand out. Whereas the bed bug's hairs are slightly curved backwards. So fairly easy now that I can see the difference and can easily distinguish between bed bugs and bat bugs. You're also looking for the bugs, but you're looking for cast skins too. And you're looking for fecal specking, right? All these black spots here will tell you possibly have an active infestation. Now, when I'm working in housing uh, complexes, multi-unit structures that have had infestations in the past, I have to see live bed bugs to count it as an active infestation because there'll be plenty of evidence of past activity. So I don't count cast skins or fecal specking as an active infestation. If I never had an infestation before, then I guess I would. All right, bed bugs can fit into anything that's about the width of the edge of a credit card. So if you could slick, stick a credit card into a crack and crevice, it's big enough to hold a bed bug. And those are all the, all the places you need to look when you're looking for bed bug. So when we do an inspection, we usually start with the bed and we'll take the bedding and stick it in a plastic bag. Now we used to say, go ahead and launder it, stick it in the washing machine first. Now we say, go right to the dryer. So it's very, very intensive to do a complete inspection. First thing you do is remove the bedding, then you're gonna check all the mattress seams. If the mattress is clean, you're gonna find a clean spot, take it off the box spring. You're gonna check the outside of the box spring, you turn the box spring over, you're gonna remove that dust cover. Then you're gonna look where it's stapled against that fabric. That's a nice tight spot that the bed bugs will often hide in. And if you look at this one here, can you see what's between, so you have these cross supports, wooden cross supports in the box spring, but you can see what's above them between that and the fabric is cardboard. Could you imagine if bed bugs got into here? They would have unlimited harborage. It'd be very difficult to treat them. All right, next thing you do after the box spring is inspected, then you would look at the frame, especially those cracks and crevices, and then you work your way out to the furniture and to the chairs and the dressers, uh, with the chairs, you also want to turn it over and take that dust cover off. And it's quite challenging now. Much of our furniture is made of plywood, which will have gaps, and it makes it very difficult to treat to get into those gaps. When you're doing an inspection, it's very helpful to have at least two people. You're moving large furniture. Uh, because I tend to be shorter and the mattress is very large, I have a hard time balancing these things without using the head and my shoulder and my hands. And if they did have bed bugs, I would end up getting them all over me. So it's very helpful to have at least two people doing this so you don't have to, you only have to use your hands to move the furniture. So this, this is just a generalization, all right? You're not gonna really find an infestation like this, but we're just gonna generalize for now. Most of the bed bugs are gonna be closely associated with the bed. So this schematic here says 
So again, the mattresses, the frames, the box springs, the, even the dust ruffles and wall, the wall headboards or anything mounted on the wall, you can see bed bugs making their way there. Go another five feet out, they're saying here, you're gonna pick up another 23%. So that's your nightstands, your dressers, tables, chairs. And I haven't mentioned previously where the baseboards, the space between the baseboard and the wall, you get a gap in there, bed bugs will get in there. Uh, and carpeting, if you have wall to wall carpeting, there's a tack strip under here, a nice rough piece of wood, the bed bugs like to get under there and lay their eggs. And now, uh, especially on furniture, look at those recessed screw holes. You can see this one here is just covered uh, in eggs. These are all hatched. You can see they're, they're hollow now, but there had been a bunch of eggs in here. And then other places, just about anywhere else, right? The smoke detectors, the wall outlets, the switches, popcorn ceiling behind objects hanging on the wall, just about anything. I think some of the most uncommon places have been in a beard of a man, uh, folds of skin of an overweight person, and in a coffee maker. So I guess I can picture this happening as a person has their robe on their bed, they get up to make their coffee, right? The bed bugs are on the robe. They start the coffee maker, it's warm. The bed bugs move off looking for some, the warmth. Remember it's it's carbon dioxide that gets them moving and then heat and chemical odors that get them moving towards the host. So I could see it moving towards the coffee maker because of the heat. And we've had students call where uh, bed bugs were crawling out of their laptops. So uh, when you're thinking about multi-unit structures, we think early detection is very important, mostly to stop them from spreading. But if we catch them early, we can use non-chemical controls to sufficiently control them. If we catch them early, they don't have to throw the furniture away, it can be treated. If people know they don't have to prep and their furniture is gonna be treated, they're more likely to report. So lots of good reasons to find these bed bugs early. Now, all kinds of tools to help with that. We've already talked about a complete visual inspection, but we have canine scent detection teams and monitors and then combinations of these things. So here's a canine scent detection team. And this is a fairly expensive endeavor to get into. It might be five, ten thousand dollars to get a dog and to get it trained. Another five thousand dollars to get the handler trained with the dog. So a pretty big investment on the front end. Uh, in a controlled environment, 97 percent accurate. Work done out of New Jersey has shown, though, I think they looked at eight different teams uh, in a multi-unit structure and we only have 44% accuracy and 15% false positives. So false positive meaning that the dog team indicates bed bugs are there, but no bed bugs are found. And my response to this is, well, Jen, you just put out monitors and check those monitors regularly to see if you find anything. Don't treat until you find anything because we know we often with sprays, we have to hit the bed bugs directly for them to be effective. So here's some of the monitors, and these are the ones that have, uh, have the most research behind them. The two on the left are climb-ups. They either have a black or white tape on the outside, a rough surface. And these are put under the legs of beds or upholstered furniture. And bed bugs, again, that carbon dioxide gets them moving. They're negatively geotropic. They wanna climb up to find the host. So they climb up this bowl and it's rough. So they can do that with their tarsal claws. And then they fall into the steep vertical surface. With the first two, they're dusted with talc so they can't get out. The uh, blackout is just smooth, polished plastic and they can't get there out. This last one, the Sensi Volcano, you notice it's not big enough to go under the leg of a bed and it's not meant to. It can go against the leg or against the wall. And with this one, you could also add a lure, uh, smells like the body odors, uh, and you'll increase the trap catch, but it also increases the cost of the trap. So typically these passive pitfall monitors, again, under the legs of the bed and upholstered furniture. So here's a, um, a one bedroom apartment. Again, we have eight to maybe 12 uh, of these monitors being used at a time. And with this study here from Rutgers, they had two studies that used this technique. They came back two weeks later and they detected bed bugs in 89 to 94% of the infested apartments. That's a pretty good detection rate. We started talking to housing managers about using that many monitors and they're doing the math. 
say we can get a monitor for two dollars and fifty cents and you put eight in an apartment well that's twenty dollars multiply that by 200 apartments you have and that's four thousand dollars and even though they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on bed bug control a year just that that amount of upfront cost is a deterrent to them so we went and we looked at putting one two or four monitors in a room and we did almost as well with the detection 80 to 90 percent accuracy but it took us longer it took us three to four weeks where it only took the Rutgers crew putting out more monitors only one to two weeks to detect that level so we moved on to something called a quick inspection now we send two people into an apartment one goes to the bed one goes to the living room and looks at the upholstered furniture sheets are taken off we look along edges seams tags whatever we're not flipping anything the other person go to the upholstered furniture, can turn pillows, but not turning the furniture, looking at zippers, seams, any place we have fabric gathering, looking on the exterior for bed bugs. We can get in and out on average in three minutes. And that includes 30 seconds to get through the door. We put out monitors only if we suspect bed bugs are there, but we can't find them. So what do you mean suspect? Well, if we see fecal specking or shed skins, or we see cans of bed bug spray, or the resident happens to be there and they say they're getting bit by bed bugs or they've seen bed bugs, or if the apartment has been treated recently. Then we'll stick out monitors and we'll try to get one under, one under each leg of the bed and the upholstered furniture. If we can't get to it, if we can't lift it, it goes against the edge. So here's an example of, of one year we did uh, three buildings. This is all for senior and disabled mid to high rises. Two were publicly owned, one was privately owned. But again, we're doing that quick inspection. One person goes to the bed, one person goes to the upholstered furniture, and then we only put out those monitors under the legs of the uh, bed and the upholstered furniture if we suspect bed bugs were there, but we haven't found them. So this one first apartment, they aren't doing any building-wide inspections, and they're only using chemical controls. Out of 267 apartments, we found bed bugs in 22% of them, and they had low, medium, and heavy infestation levels. So very high levels of bed bug, and management was unaware of 86% of these infested rooms. The next two are, uh, apartments are using, are conducting regular building-wide inspections, and they're gonna do much better. So this one here is 215 apartments in 11 stories. They're actually just a few miles apart. Uh, they use heat when bed bugs are found. They might also follow up with diatomaceous earth. They ask the residents to vacuum up all the dead bed bugs. So it's obvious if they still have activity. In this apartment complex, only 1.4% of the rooms were infested. They had two with less than 10 and one with 11 to 50 bed bugs in an apartment. And the next one's only a mid-rise. It's only four stories. They're inspecting the building two to four times a year. If they find bed bugs, they do in-house heat treatments, either electrical or with propane. We found three apartments that had bed bugs, but they were all low levels. So um, you see the difference when they're doing these building one inspections and using non-chemical controls, there have much lower levels of bed bugs in the structure. Well, some things we did find out were that it can be very difficult to see bed bugs sometimes. So we were concentrating on the beds and the upholstered furniture. We did one floor, we're down to the next one, and one of the residents comes up to us and says, hey, hey, um, you know the bed bugs are on the walls. I'm like, no, we didn't see any on the walls. So we go back to the last apartment and sure enough, on this red brick wall, the bed bugs were blending right in broad daylight on the mortar joint. Uh, we we there was bed bug activity there. In 2018-2019, we've been through about eight buildings here. And I noticed uh, this is, if you look at each of these rectangles, the stack is one building, and each little rectangle is a floor. So in the second building, I noticed we had very many infestations on the second from the top floor of the building. 
And so I finally had some time to go and map the soil to see if any other buildings had that same uh, spatial occurrence. And we don't. There's no obvious pattern here. So bed bugs are being introduced by the resident. And then the bed bugs are either moving on their own accord, actively moving through pipes, wires, conduit, ductwork, walls, uh, or being helped by hitchhiking again on the um, resonance as they move from place to place. But they're not moving within the building, searching for a particular temperature or anything like that. We did notice in this 2018A building, this is a building we had used four years ago. And we were looking for bed bugs. We felt like they were there, but we couldn't find them. And then we remembered, hey, this was this is the building we used monitor study for a monitor study. And we looked under the bed and sure enough, pushed together in the middle of bed, not against any legs, were these monitors, and there were the bed bugs. And that was the only place we found them. So we have to ask the question, and did these monitors prevent the bed bugs from establishing in this apartment? So now that we've found, we've searched, we've inspected, we found our bed bugs, what do we do? Well, the Achilles heel of bed bugs Hello. is... Hello? Hey, Lars, how are you? <laughs> so the um, Achilles heel is 122 I, I degrees hey, I Fahrenheit. I didn't know if and um, if all. we can get them subjected to that any stage, eggs, nymphs, adults, they're gonna die. So now we say to put clothing bedding well, directly into the dryer. Go there first because well, you'll get what, hotter what, faster what, what, and kill the bed bugs. We can also, uh, just a reminder, this was a study in science, scientific reports that showed that dirty laundry is attractive to bed bugs. So if you're traveling, make sure you're bringing us in so you aren't attracting bed bugs to your luggage. All right, so heat, uh, is very effective, as we said. Uh, typically, we will try to get the, if we're using a whole room heating system, we're gonna get the temperature up to 130, maybe 145. Get it to a lethal temperature, lethal temperatures, and then start moving things around, opening drawers, opening dressers, getting the air circulated. So if the bed bugs do move away from the heat, they're gonna be moving out to a lethal temperature. So this is a bit tricky. It can be, you know, it's very expensive for a company to get involved with this. It could be $100,000 to get started by the time you buy the heaters and the fans and the trailer and the generators for the power. Power is very tricky with these. Sometimes you need 220, sometimes 110. Uh, sometimes you need four different circuits. Uh, so many companies will then go have their own generators and run the cords in. Um, and propane heats up very quickly and you're more likely to melt things. You have to worry about fire sprinklers going off. And you might cause more damage with the water flooding uh, than you would with the heat. So there's lots of things that need to be worked out with heating systems. To be effective, you have to have probes, temperature probes hidden in, in hard to heat places to make sure you're getting those up to 122 degrees. Don't, this is something you want a professional to do. There's many examples in the newspapers uh, about people destroying their property, trying to kill bed bugs. So here's one where maintenance staff had a truck that they kept getting bed bug bites in. And so they decided the way to solve this problem was to bring in their own heating equipment because they use it to dry floors or whatever they were using it for. They just altered its use. You can see here they've melted the seat belts. They've ruined their console. They melted their visor. And guess what? The next day, bed bugs were still there. Not that they had survived the treatment, but somebody was bringing them in. And um, yeah, so I suggested they bring, give monitors out to the employees that use this truck and see if they detect any bed bugs and then have their home treat it so they wouldn't keep introducing them. You'll, you'll see pictures of this where people have used alcohol. And this case here, I think they used alcohol. It was, it was just a couple of weeks before Christmas. They had lit candles and it caught the apartment complex on fire. 10 people lost their homes. You'll, you'll see other cases where people spray down their couch, uh, forget they did it, spray it down with alcohol and uh, later light a cigarette and the couch catches on fire. They get this wise idea. They'll just throw the couch out on the lawn. The couch gets stuck in the door frame and the whole house goes up. So 
We do not recommend using alcohol. It has no residual. So if people think they're going to spray their bed and it's safe to stay in there at night, that stuff evaporates very quickly. Um, it's not going to give them protection. And work out of Rutgers has shown, I think, 60 to 7 percent, 60 to 70 percent efficacy when you hit them directly with alcohol. So it can kill some of them, but not very many. And it doesn't last, and it's a flammable hazard. We do not recommend it. Other options for heat are to use tents. There's different tents on the market ranging from $1,000 to $6,000 by the time you include the heaters. So this is something an apartment complex might want to invest in. They could heat treat people's furniture rather than throwing it away. For travelers, this is something you might want to consider. This is about $200. This, if you, if you come back from, you've been traveling, you could throw your clothes right into the dryer and then take your suitcase and put it in this little zap bug heater. It's got a little sensor that stays inside and a little Bluetooth uh, reader outside so you can see that it's heat hitting the temperatures you want it to hit. You can also deliver uh, heat through steam. That's a very slow process. Uh, about a, you move about an inch per second and when you run an infrared thermometer over it the surface of the fabric should be about 160 to 180. You have to be careful though because microfiber and other surfaces can be damaged. If you see here, this was a chair that we used for a research study. We were introducing bed bugs and then see if we could vacuum them out. And between each rep, we steamed to make sure there wasn't any live bed bugs left over. And you could see it looks like this is permanently brushed. Now, um, you can see up here, there's a number three on this chair. And I, I put this chair in my office now. So if you ever come to visit me in McCord Hall, uh, you'll see a number three on this chair. So if I get somebody in that chair, then they're talking for too long. This is the second time I've heard their life story. I just remind them that, you know, see that number three? This was one of our chairs we used in our bed bug study, and it's amazing how people remember something they had to do and leave. So here's a, uh, we uh, have more options for homeowners now using STEAM. This is work again out of Rutgers, comparing a commercial unit, the one on the right is a commercial unit, comparing it to the two that's afford, more affordable for homeowners. So the one in the middle there is about $100, the red one's about $75. And the, just the difference, uh, they're both as effect, all as effective, but the operating time. So the commercial one, you're gonna get 45 minutes of operating, the middle one about 45 minutes, and the, um, um, 15 minutes for a little red one. The trick with these homeowner products is don't get the ones that just have a circular nozzle opening. You don't want something with a small opening for the head. You want it spread out because if it's to get the circular one, the velocity of the steam pushes the bed bugs away before they're killed. One thing to be aware of besides ruining wood and microfiber is that the steam is not going to penetrate through leather. So you will not be able to control bed bugs living inside a leather piece of furniture. Cold is another option, but it's much longer. Remember I said a minute at 122 would kill bed bugs? Looking at cold, four to 10 days at zero degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't know, these, these freezers tend to be cluttered with a lot of stuff. And we want the bed bug to experience zero degrees Fahrenheit for four days. I tell folks if they can afford to wait days, let's just wait two weeks. And that way we're sure that they will be exposed to zero degrees Fahrenheit for at least four days. So, so uh, you know, I talked about putting clothing in the dryer. Be careful putting your shoes in there. All that bouncing around in the heat will cause glue to come apart, to soften, and the shoe could come apart. So one option for shoes is to put them in a plastic bag in the freezer or you can um, stick them in there's dryer shelves that will keep it from bouncing around or in the dryer, you, someone else suggested putting the shoelaces through the door so it's not bouncing and just getting heated. And casements are another option. Um, these cover the, the mattress and the box spring. The, it keeps the bed bugs inside. So if they're inside, they can't come out and bite you but it doesn't kill bed bugs. Eventually over time they die, but it also makes it easier to inspect. So if, if bed bugs were to get introduced here, most likely they're gonna either go along this tag 
they're going to go along the zipper. It's a nice light surface, easy to find the bed bugs. Just be careful that you don't tear this as you set it into the frame. Uh, you might want to actually tape down any rough surfaces so you don't tear it. Vacuuming is also a, a component of monitoring the bed bugs. It won't very, very well as a standalone, but it does help. So we like to put a knee-high into the end of the tube and fold it over and then put a crevice tool and push down that crevice tool and it'll remove eggs. So here's an example of we uh, intercepted some heavily infested furniture from a um, high-rise apartment uh, on its way to the dump. We put it inside these inflatable pools and dusted the inside with talc. And then we had a student a vacuum. So she averaged, I think, about eight to nine minutes per vacuuming event, and we vacuumed twice a week. This was a little helper we found. An immature assassin bug was found feeding on a bed bug. There's lots of predators of bed bugs, ants, spiders, cockroaches, as you see here, assassin bugs, but no one will tolerate these in their home. They'll consider those pests too. It took us a very long time with twice a week vacuuming. We started the November 6th or 9th, and it was till the end of February before we got them out. Uh, the tears now, as I mentioned earlier, have this plywood construction. There's often gaps where they're hitting in, and it's very difficult to find them. So we averaged almost 850 bed bugs per piece of furniture, about 110 days, almost four months to get them all out. So not something you, that someone's going to stand for. They're not going to stick their furniture in a pool and not sit on it for four months. So it's a supplement to a program, but not a standalone. Lint rollers. If you don't have one of these in your car or in your office, you need to go get one now. Uh, we carry one of these wherever we go. We use this one, the Evercare uh, one for pet hair, the green handle. It's great for vehicle. It's great for clients to capture their bed bugs this way. And for the pest management professional, now when Jennifer and I go and we're on our 100th apartment for the day, sometimes the resident doesn't want us let us let us in because we're afraid we're carrying bed bugs with us. So then we just pull a lint roller out and roll it all over clothing, and then they'll let us in. So we're treating with chemicals. We're going to go into the cracks and crevices, all those places that we were looking for bed bugs, and multi-unit apartments. We really need to inspect left, right, above, below, and across the hall. Dust are going to go into those cracks and crevices, some at the beds, uh, baseboards, and at the penetrations through the walls. As can sprays. Dust seems to, we know with the sprays because of resistance that um, uh, it takes a very long time for bed bugs to die uh, with the sprays. So you have to hit them directly to, to be very effective. So dust do have a residual where the sprays really don't. And fumigation, sometimes if you're dealing with a cabin with many cracks and crevices, we need to resort to fumigation because we just can't possibly treat all those cracks and crevices. And then to determine if bed bugs are gone, don't just rely on a visual inspection. Add extra monitors and put them around the wall, away from the sleeping areas. Here's an example that was presented in 2011. These are five apartments across the bottom and on the left, on the y-axis, and the number of bed bugs found. So this company went in, treated for bed bugs, and wanted to see if they were eliminated. They did a visual inspection. You can see there's one bed bug found in apartment four. So at this point, they're patting themselves on the back. Only one bed bug, four out of five apartments. That's pretty good. Then they look at the climb ups that were placed at the bed and they see they have three apartments that still have bed bugs. And when they look at the climb up monitors away from the bed against the walls, then they see they totally failed. So that's a totally different story, isn't it? Thinking, oh, I did a great job with just a visual inspection. So it's really important to follow up looking at those monitors. The Rutgers protocol says to go uh, three times, two weeks apart. And if you have no bed bugs in your monitors, you'll probably eliminate the bed bugs. All right, we have lots of uh, resources for you to refer to. Bedbugs.utk.edu will have links to most of our publications that you see listed here. We will be holding an in-service if, if COVID uh, allows us to. Uh, we've set one up for the last week in February. So this will be bed bugs, household insects, and fire ants. And uh, we'll do a fire ant bait demonstration and a bed bug inspection of the cabinets. So um, mark that on your calendars. We're going to start uh, in Greenville on the 23rd and work our, work our way across west across the state through the 4-H camps ending in 
Lone Oaks on the 26th. And we want to thank the USDA, different grants for our research and extension programs. And I'll take any questions you may have.